Our final speaker for the night is Dr. Ray Smith. Uh, after serving on the faculty at the University of Manitoba and Virginia Tech, Dr. Smith joined the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences uh, at UK in 2004. His program is focused on the research of lagoon pastures, forage production, grazing trials, forage varieties, and many other topics. Through the years, he's dedicated significant time in or organizing forage conferences at the county, state, national, and international level. Dr. Smith is very well known by county agents and forage producers across the state for always being willing to help. Dr. Smith, good to see you tonight. Good to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I'm gonna talk about why is investments for pasture management. Um, I'll follow up with some of the things that we've already talked about and, and, and hopefully give you a few new things as well. So I'm gonna mention weed control, really just reminding you um, of things Dr. Whip said, but that, that is of these five practices, um, one that's important. We'll talk about fertilizer or fertilizing. Um, and then I'll mention some things on applying nitrogen specifically. Then I'll talk about overseeding. And the last, but definitely not least, is just the value of resting your pastures. Now, Dr. Whip talked about buttercup and this was a few years ago um, in a horse pasture. So Bill, you didn't mention this, but I'll, I'll mention it for you that it's definitely too late to spray when the buttercup is flowering like this. Um, so you need to spray buttercup, um, as you mentioned, Bill, um, we're really talking February, early March. Um, so just, um, I'll show you a publication in a minute that Dr. Whit helped write. Uh, but let me first talk about Weed control is often misused, and, and Dr. Witt related to that. You know, you want to make sure you know what weeds are there, spray the ones that are there. Um, some herbicides, as Dr. Witt mentioned, have good residual control, meaning it'll control weeds after the spray. Um, other ones don't last very long. But the unintended consequence of killing weeds is you have bare soil. And so then you need to um, do something to cover that bare soil. Um, reseeding, or if it's not large areas, um, just rest in the pasture. So you gotta be very careful with what herbicide you use because they have different periods or different weight periods before reseeding. On uh, the cost of the product of herbicides, I, I put here just a range that Krista came up with, 12 to $24, can range even higher. But my main point is if you've got weed issues, then the cost per acre is not that large to control them with a herbicide uh, if there are significant issues. If there's just few, a few weeds, but just as unsightly, you may be much better to just be patient and use good grazing management. Dr. Whit and Dr. Green wrote this publication, Broadleaf Weeds of Kentucky Pastures. It's on their website and, and also on our Forge website. I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. So it shows photos of weeds. Your county agents can also help you identify weeds and then it gives just a simple chart. Dr. Witt talked about a number of um, things, but like the buttercup, you're looking here on this chart, February, March is the time to spray. It gives the herbicides that work well. Um, and then you look at the individual label of the herbicide to come up with um, those specific rules and those specific rates. So weed control is, is a good option to consider, um, but don't think of that as a silver bullet. If you've got major issues in your pasture, there may be well be other things you need to do because you can kill weeds every year, but if you've got low nutrients or you're overgrazing, they're gonna to continue to come back. So fertilizer is often misunderstood in, in, in how, to, how to apply the fertilizer, when you need to apply the fertilizer. Um, and when I'm talking about fertilizer in this context, I'm gonna talk about mainly, particularly in Kentucky, applying lime, to change the pH, applying phosphorus and applying potassium. So the real value of applying those nutrients is maximizing the production and also the stand life. It's safe to apply fertilizers in these particular products when the horses are on the field. The only real risk in applying a fertilizer is if, if you're contracting someone to apply fertilizer and their machinery is not working well and maybe they stop at the end of the field and a, and a big pile of fertilizer comes out and makes a big pile and the horses wanna eat that. So you simply need to um, just take a, a, a quick look after the fertilizer applied to, to make sure that it's actually spread out throughout the whole field. So it came up with just a simple cost per acre. Um, and, and this is just kind of maybe an average recommendation um, in central Kentucky. 
obviously each of your areas it would vary. Um, a typical recommendation may be a ton and a half of lime per acre. Our current rates are about $24 a ton. Uh, 100 pounds per acre potash, that's the main form or way that we apply potassium. Um, 20 pounds or $20 per acre at the, the rate there I'm quoted. Custom applicator cost. Um, lime is a little bit more than the other fertilizer, so put the $9 cost, so $65. Now you may say, oh, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot to put out every year. But the critical thing is only apply fertilizer if your soil test calls for it. And in Kentucky and most states in the US, the Extension Service will test the soil for you and at little or no cost, take it to your county extension office. Look that up online if you don't know where that is or who your county um, extension agent is. In pastures, testing every two to three years is fine because you're not removing a lot of nutrients. If you're producing hay, you would need to test every year. And you can apply that lime, phosphorus, and potassium at any time of the year, um, with the exception of when it's wet, so you're gonna cause ruts in the field. So apply based on the soil test recommendation. And you can't fertilize your way out of poor management. The same as you can't um, use herbicides um, to spray your way out of poor management. If you've got poor management and you've got weeds growing or you've got weeds growing because the nutrients are low, um, you need to do other things. So the example I'm showing you here is this was an area of a field that was cut um, down to half inch tall four times during the season. Um, it would simulate close grazing or it would simulate close hay cutting, but we applied 60 pounds of nitrogen 100 pounds of potash three times during the season. 180 pounds of nitrogen, 300 pounds of potassium, uh, plenty of fertilizer, but really all we ended up doing because that, that close defoliation was, was knocking back the orchard grass, we were just fertilizing the weeds. But over here, where we di didn't apply nitrogen or potassium, the phosphorus is already high in this field, but we left four inches after we had um, clipped the field or the same thing, leaving four inches after grazing. Look how thick the stand is. Um, so we'll come back to this in a moment when we talk about grazing management. Now I'm separating nitrogen. I mean, it is a fertilizer. The typical way that we buy nitrogen and apply it is urea, or that's the most easily accessible form. It's often underappreciated with the value. And I put here that no soil test is needed for nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is not very, doesn't last long in the soil. So heavy rains, wash it through the soil. Um, cool, wet weather, it volatilizes into the air. Nitrogen is a nutrient that is used when it's there and it's used by grasses. But in a field that's predominantly grasses, it's gonna be used by the grass and then become deficient. If you have clover in the field, you're gonna have nitrogen added by the clover. So my, my point is you don't soil test for nitrogen. You're going to apply it based on just, um, I'll mention a publication in just a second. It does increase yield. Definitely you would put a fair bit if you're cutting for hay, but it has a useful application in pasture. Fall application of nitrogen, and I'm talking really once um, you get into about October, once you don't have some of the weedy grasses like the foxtail or crabgrass growing, applying nitrogen in the fall encourages leafy fall growth strong winter roots, early spring green up. In essence, it thickens up the grass stand. It's been used in um, turf grass applications for years, but it, it applies in pastures as well. Early spring application, um, when the grass just start, starts greening up, low applications of nitrogen can boost new seedlings um, and overgrazed pastures. Remember though that nitrogen, it benefits all species, grasses and weeds, um, so that's part of why I'm talking about this fall application is you're not, you're not fertilizing your ragweed or your foxtail because those have finished growing. So in this example, 80 pounds of urea per acre, that would be a, equivalent to about 40 pounds of actual nitrogen. Um, you can see the cost there, the custom application rate would be about $23 per acre. That would be hiring someone to come out and spread it for you. So fairly low, low cost to get some good growth in the grasses in the fall. So to get to the uh, publication on fertilizing, 
Um, and in many of our publications, Google KY Forages, you get to our homepage, click on equine, you see a list of publications. Um, the herbicide publication that Dr. Witt mentioned is there that I showed you. Um, here's one on soil sampling, nutrient management, horse pastures. And in fact, when we talk about some of the upcoming events and other things like that, um, UK is very good about having um, the, the things easy to find. Might not be easy to find going through a particular website, but if you Google Equine Showcase, um, University of Kentucky, it'll come up with that event as you, uh, that you saw listed earlier. Overseeding. Now, this is often a poorly executed, uh, but, but a valuable way to help improve pastures. Now I'm gonna limit my talk today to overseeding, thickening up existing pastures, rather than completely reseeding. Dr. Witt mentioned if you have a whole lot of nimble will, then you probably need to start over. That would be spraying the whole field with Roundup and, and planting from scratch. But I'm talking about filling in bare areas. Another big advantage to overseeding, not just filling in bare areas, but that's gonna give competition for weeds. If you've got, if you're seeding grasses in September, then they're competing with the growth of the weeds, some of the ones even that we talked about, some of those winter annual weeds in, in hemlock and in, in buttercup, the ground is shaded that those weeds are gonna have a harder time ever getting started. Timing is critical and um, rest is needed for establishment. And I'll follow up on that in a minute. Um, cost per acre depends on what rate you're overseeding. If you've got a whole lot of bare area, you're probably going 20 to 30 pounds per acre. Um, if you've just got a few bare areas, you may just go with 15 pounds per acre. The cost I've given here is, is um, seeding improved varieties, not just buying the cheapest seed at the store. Um, again, on our website, we've got our forage variety testing program. You can look at um, the varieties or talk to your um, local co-op or other farm dealership about um, improved varieties to plant. You can rent a seeder. Um, you can also um, contract that to be done. Now look at the photo here before I talk about the text and here's some new grass seedlings getting started. But I talk about resting, uh, meaning once you've overseeded to take the horses off and to leave them off because if they stay on the pasture, when these new little seedlings come up, then they're gonna be nipped off right away or trampled. So you want to give those a chance to establish. And really, the more time, the better. Um, the minimum with the just an overseeding would be um, if you could leave a couple of months of rest before putting horses back on that pasture. Um, even going easy that particular fall and not putting them back on the spring would be even better. Um, but any rest period is going to be better than none. Again, use high quality improved seed. Plants enough. Um, September is the best time in Kentucky. Um, check with extension information in your, in your own state or country um, with the best time for you. Spring would be the next best time, but often it gets too warm and dry as we move into the spring and early summer for those new seedlings to get started. But when we talk about spring seeding, would we really be saying early March? Use the best method available, control competition. What I mean, if you're going to overseed, then you need to, to, to clip or to graze that area close so you don't have a lot of tall forage growing to compete with your new seedlings. And I've already mentioned rest. So no-till drill is a great way to do overseeding. A little more effort and attention to detail than just broadcasting the seed. But you've got a lot better chance to get the seed in contact with the soil planted um, so it'll come up rather than just on top of the ground. Can be successful spring or fall. There's most, um, some county offices, many, many um, Ag dealerships have no-till seed, um, seeders available to rent. Now, here's a demonstration that we did. Actually, on our U Kentucky Forages YouTube site, we have this as a time-lapse video. But it should be quite obvious to you that proper depth is a quarter to a half inch deep. On top of the ground, the seed germinated, but it never... Look, that's what I need to do. I won't go any deeper than that. But you've got to check your no-till seeder very closely. Um, if you're borrowing it and your soil conditions are wetter than the last person that used it, you'll go deeper. 
or if you're seeding, you're seeding a small seeded grass rather than grain, uh, make sure you check that depth. Take the time to do that. I've got many cases I've been called out to farms for what they would say would be a seeding failure. Usually they tell me that the seed is bad, that they bought, the, the dealership needs, needs to pay them back. Usually it's um, because they've seeded too deep. Okay, here's a number of different forages. Um, and, and I'm gonna point this out for two reasons. One is to point out just that, you know, grasses and, and legumes as well, like the clovers there are coming up quite slowly and they're vulnerable to grazing at an early stage. Also want to point out that Kentucky bluegrass, even though we like to have that in pastures, that's very slow coming up. It often takes two to three weeks before it even germinates. So you've got to be very patient with Kentucky bluegrass. Um, it's a grass that um, def definitely does best with the fall seeding. Often in the spring, it never gets a chance to really get going before hot weather. Tall fescue and orchard grass are two grasses that do well in pastures. You see that the how vigorous they are is, is, is similar to each other. The rye grasses on the far side here, the annual rye grass, perennial rye grass come up quickly. They're great to cover ground, but the annual rye grass is gonna die out in the summer. So it's a short-term fix. The perennial rye grass is gonna live for about two years. So it could be a temporary solution um, to cover in bare areas, but your real goal is planting orchard grass, Kentucky bluegrass, or an improved tall fescue. Um, if you don't have pregnant mares, the regular fescue is fine, but with pregnant mares, you want to use an improved fescue like a novel in the fight tall fescue. Now, this picture is the exact same planting, but we put a shade cloth over the top. So there was 80% shade. Now, the point I want to make here is, to, or I'm going to make two points. One is that when you've got competition, when, you, when you're seeding into a pasture that has existing growth um, or a lot of dead material, it's going to shade the plants. They're going to be very spindly. Um, and not grow very well. The other point I wanna make is that orchard grass is the most shade tolerant grass. So when you're seeding into an existing pasture and you're trying to thicken up that existing pasture, orchard grass is gonna have the best chance of competing um, with the other grasses there, as you can see here from the vigorous growth of the orchard grass, even with that shade. And here's a pasture that was overseeded. It wasn't that thin, it had a fair bit of clover. Um, you can see the drill rows of orchard grass coming up amidst the other things showing its shade tolerance. Again, as I mentioned before, Google KY Forages, you get to our Forage website, you click on equine, you're gonna pull up our equine page. You wanna find out about seeding. Um, you get to that with, um, click on establishing horse pastures and that covers overseeding and new establishment. And then you got a chart here that talks about, someone asked a question earlier about of what were good things to plant for cattle and horses. And I've mentioned the things here for horses, fits as well for cattle, with the exception Kentucky bluegrass is not real productive. So typically we don't plant it in cattle pastures, but often, at least in the Eastern half of Kentucky, it's gonna come up anyway from seeding the ground. We give the seeding rates here as well. Now, the last thing I wanna mention, and really is something that I wanna, the, probably the first thing you need to think about, I, I put here or Krista put here, the most beneficial and the most skipped thing in managing pastures, and that is rest. I'm talking a week of rest is better than none, a month of rest is even better. It's needed for grasses to rebuild their leaves and their roots after grazing. Increases stand life, increases forage quality, favors grasses over weeds, um, reduces soil erosion and nutrient leaching. Uh, you got a better view, the pasture looks better. And the cost of rest is free. Now I know you, you know, you might say, well, if I'm resting the pasture, I'm not using it. But but my point here is you've got tremendous benefits from rest um, and you're not putting cash dollars out of pocket. How and when do you rest a pasture? So here's the reasons it should be rested. I've already alluded to that before. Existing grasses need time to regrow their leaves restore the carbohydrate reserves that are in the root for long-term survival. Seedlings are especially palatable, meaning the horses like them and they don't tolerate hoof traffic. So rest is important for any pasture to regenerate and fill in. Um, it's, it's all the more important when you're seeding or overseeding. So the examples of these grasses here is just that a overgrazed pasture not only does it not have as much top growth, but the roots are thinned back because the plant's not producing enough um, carbohydrates through photosynthesis like Dr. Lawrence talked about 
to replenish the roots. Um, just a second here. So benefits of rest improve your quality, reduce the weed pressure, reduce the soil erosion as I've commented, also compensates for spot grazing. Horses tend to be spot grazers. They like to graze an area close and they tend to keep grazing it close because it has that really high quality grass just starting to come back. Less hay and grain needed if you rest. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so here's two orchard grass plants. We could probably all agree that these have definitely been rested and they're growing in excellent condition. They've been maintained at ideal conditions in the greenhouse. Now, two plants very similar to this, we did a little experiment with. Okay, the one on the left, we clipped it down to one inch tall, like a close grazing would be or a spot grazing would be. The one on the right, we clipped to three and a half inches. And then the only difference, the way we manage these two plants is this one was clipped to one inch every week for one month. So it started out that healthy, vigorous plant clipped to one inch once a week for one month. This was clipped to three and a half inches at the beginning of the month and at the end of the month. And I'm showing you the amount of regrowth on these two orchard grass plants after six days. So giving the rest, you look at how much more vigorous the orchard grass came back how much better it would be able to compete with weeds, how much better it would be to provide forage to the horses versus this, this would represent a pasture that horses were on continuously and kept grazing the orchard grass down. And orchard grass is highly palatable. They like it a lot. They're gonna to continue to graze it down. Okay, here's another example of where rest can be a benefit over winter. And we, we, we need horses, we need pasture areas for horses over winter, um, but if that can be one pasture that maybe gets overgrazed while the other ones are being rested, or maybe it's a, um, some kind of pad area where they're on most of the winter um, so the pastures can be rested. So this was rested all winter long. This is the kind of residue that was there um, going into the spring. This was one that was grazed, grazed all winter long. We just dug up pot size areas of those pastures and put them in the pots here. This is what happened. This is after about nine days. This is after about 15 days of regrowth. Much more vigorous regrowth coming back from that rest, from that pasture not being grazed into the ground. Um, less weed content there as well. Now, all of these um, photos of plants I've showed you, we have as video clips. You can look at them as a time-lapse photography um, at our Kentucky Forages YouTube. In fact, if you just Google KY Forages YouTube, We'll come up with, actually, we'll put up this presentation and the presentations given um, this evening in a few days. We can go back to all the presentations that have been given in the forage area over the last um, number of years. But here, time-lapse forage videos. Um, you can look at each of those to give you, actually see what's happening based on those management situations I mentioned. How do you rest a pasture? Um, that's simple and maybe not so simple. Graze the pasture down, but don't graze closer than three to four inches then remove the horses. Um, if it's really uneven, um, then a clipping four to five inches to even out pasture height. Allow the pasture to rest two to four weeks or at least let there be regrowth eight to 10 inches. Um, if you've got weeds growing up taller than that, um, you could do a mowing um, if needed. But, but often if you're practicing um, resting the pastures, um, the, the mowing for weeds, the herbicide um, are, are less needed and then return the horses to grazing. So you could um, have horses, like say you have four paddocks and you've got four horses and each paddock is two acres in size. You could leave a horse on each paddock um, for the full season. The problem is there's gonna be spot grazing. They're gonna overgraze certain areas. Other areas are gonna have weed growth. If you can do a simple thing as putting two horses in each paddock and then every two to three weeks, move those two horses and in, in each of the two paddocks down to the other ones, that's gonna be a benefit. Now it's gonna be even better if you have more paddocks than that. Or with these four paddocks, you put four horses on one paddock and move them to the next one and the next one, the next one every week. But you can do rotational grazing without getting real complicated, without having a huge number of paddocks or without moving every few days. Um, any rest is gonna be beneficial. Uh, more rest is better. 
So if we add up all those costs I came up with, just kind of a, an average ballpark for what I mentioned, it's $103, $153 per acre with the overseeding, with the fall nitrogen, with the fertilizer, um, with some herbicide application. I'm seeing you say, wow, that's a lot. Now, my point is the fertilizer, we're talking every three years. I mean, even the weed control, that's going to be limited how often you need to do that if you're, if you're using good management. Is it worth the cost? Now, think about it this way. You may double the growth of your usable forage by using the practices that I talked about. You could easily go um, from two tons per acre of desirable grass to four tons per acre. And you may have four tons per acre, but if you've got a lot of weeds, that doesn't do you any good. So using the practices I've talked about, we're talking about potentially doubling the production. So think about it. You say, well, I can't afford 150 feet per acre um, even every three years. How much does two tons of hay, high quality hay cost? And I say high quality hay because uh, pasture is a very high quality forage. Um, so you're gonna need to be re replacing that. So I wanna end just with mentioning that website. I told you you could Google it and get to the equine page. Um, if you wanna get to our general um, UK equine programs website, then just Google um, UK equine programs. Uh, you're going to get to that. We've got on our a link on our Forge Equine site or the Equine Programs website, or just Google Equine Science Review. Okay, it's a, a new publication, um, but it follows up on our Bluegrass Equine Digest. And so it's got monthly articles of all the things that are happening at University of Kentucky from a research standpoint, from the extension standpoint, from just an applied standpoint. Like we have people that have signed up to this from all over the world. Um, but we focus on what we're finding at University of Kentucky. So you can subscribe to that and get it, get it on a monthly basis. Contact your county agents for information. Um, if you go to our Forge website in the equine tab, we also describe um, what we can do in more detailed evaluations of your pasture with our UK horse pasture evaluation project. Um, and Krista Lay, the co-author of this presentation, is the coordinator of that program. Um, she's out of town now, but I am definitely would be glad to talk to you about that program. One highlight I want to mention to you, if some people are thinking about doing complete renovations of their forages, or they're worried about issues with tall fescue, um, we've got a whole tall fescue renovation workshop. I'm coming up um, in a virtual fashion, Fe February 23rd, 24th, 25th. We've got it in person at the Bluegrass Stockyards, um, following all the um, COVID protocols, um, even, even have um, veterinary race approved certifications, um, hours for that. I've got the direct link to the website, um, but again, if you go to our Forge website and click under events, um, you'll see the registration to these. So glad for any questions. And as we commented earlier, um, all three of the speakers will be glad to answer questions for you.